Stone veneer is one of the more premium cladding options on the market, and we see it installed in high-end homes all the time, as well as in some nicer spec homes. However, walls with stone veneers are often plagued with moisture problems, especially if you're using a thin, adhered stone veneer, and we often find water damage, mold, and rot behind walls with stone veneers, and these remediations are not cheap. Some stone veneer jobs can be tens of thousands of dollars, so you really want to make sure that you're getting this right the first time around. In this video, we're going to talk about why we get moisture problems and rot in walls with stone veneers, and how to prevent these moisture failures from happening in the first place, so you're not wasting a whole bunch of money ripping out all of that expensive stone veneer to remediate a rotten structure. Let's get into it. So why do we see so many problems with wood framed walls clad with stone veneers? Well, it has a lot to do with the nature of stone and the mortar. Stone veneer, as well as other claddings like brick and stucco, are a category of materials called reservoir claddings, meaning that they have the ability to absorb, store, and redistribute a lot of water due to their porous nature. That water can be transferred very easily if the stone veneer is in direct contact with the weather resistive barrier or the house wrap, or if we have mortar droppings that have clogged the drain space, and we get the capillary transfer of water due to capillary continuity between these materials. There's no capillary break separating the stone veneer from the wood-framed wall or the weather-resistive barrier. We can also get hydrostatic pressure that gets exerted onto that WRB if mortar droppings are holding water in tension against the waterproofing, and this is essentially the weight of water exerting itself against the building, which accelerates bulk water intrusion. Thin stone veneers, which are essentially adhered to the wall rather than bearing onto a foundation ledge, have another big problem in addition to all of this. Thin stone veneers can end up falling off of the wall if there's moisture present and it's unable to dry out. This is most common if a polymer modified mortar is used, as the polymer additives lose their strength in wet conditions. Polymer modification also has a tendency to reduce the vapor permeability of the mortar, so the thin stone veneers stay wetter for longer. Apart from the weakened bond between the mortar and the stone veneer interface, natural stone contains mineral salts, and the water absorbed by the mortar will want to dilute those salt concentrations, which results in osmotic pressure at the mortar to stone interface, causing the stone to pop off of the wall. But even if you have good drainage and or a capillary break, the building can still get wet by vapor diffusion. Remember, that stone has the ability to sequester a lot of water, and when the sun hits the surface of that stone veneer, vapor is driven into the building to the drier interior space, as moisture moves from high concentrations to low concentrations, and we can end up with condensation on the backside of our drywall, especially if we're air conditioning the interior space. So what's the solution? We need a ventilated drainage gap, which will help to drain and dry out that stone veneer if it gets wet, and prevent the buildup of hydrostatic pressure against the weather-resistive barrier. The drainage gap will serve as a capillary break as well, and we need a vapor retarder between the stone veneer and the wall. Not necessarily a vapor barrier, but something to slow down inwardly driven moisture. For traditional stone veneers that bear on a foundation ledge or a steel angle, we already need an air gap between the weather resistive barrier and the stone. This is a code requirement, and this inherently provides a capillary break and a drainage space, granted that weeps are provided at the base of the wall, and that the mortar droppings aren't clogging up that space. The key here is to maintain drainage and to provide ventilation within this gap. We want ventilation weeps at the bottom and at the top of the wall to facilitate ventilation in addition to drainage, and to prevent mortar droppings from clogging up that drainage space, we want to provide some sort of drainage mesh or mortar collection device that suspends the mortar droppings and allows for unrestricted drainage below. There are a lot of products on the market like this, but you're essentially looking for something that has a similar composition to a Brillo pad. As far as controlling inward vapor drive, we have a couple of different strategies at our disposal. We can either specify a self-adhered or fluid-applied weather-resistive barrier product that has a slightly lower perm rating, let's say in the 10 perm range wet cup, or we can specify a rigid foam insulation product, which inherently is a vapor retarder to slow down inwardly driven vapor, while also providing the benefits of a continuous thermal break on the outside, which will help to reduce the potential for condensation on the backside of the sheathing. It's also helpful to apply a vapor permeable penetrating sealer over the stone veneer to reduce the amount of water absorbed by the stone and the mortar, which in theory reduces the quote-unquote reservoir. Just a reminder, if you are finding this video helpful, please hit that like button down below and leave us a comment if you have any questions, and we'll either try to answer it in the comments below or address it in a future video. Now, if we're dealing with a thin stone veneer, 
That again is adhered to the wall with thin set. We want to provide a drainage membrane between the surface of the WRB and the stone veneer, and this can be accomplished either by using a dimple mat, some entangled mesh that has a filter fabric bonded to it, or some other drainage mat or drainage membrane matrix. All of these systems are able to uncouple the thin stone veneer from the weather-resistive barrier to provide a capillary break and to alleviate the buildup of hydrostatic pressure through drainage and ventilation. We tend to prefer using a dimple mat with an integrated lath, as this eliminates the additional steps of implementing an expanded metal lath, and it provides the benefits of a vapor retarder to slow down inwardly driven moisture. If you do use an entangled mesh product instead, then you need to use a vapor retarder somewhere behind it since the entangled mesh will allow for the migration of water vapor. Now if you're using the dimple mat approach, it's still a good idea to avoid using any polymer modified mortars, as moisture can't dry through the dimple mat itself, and therefore it's expected that the mortars will stay wetter for a longer period of time. If you use an entangled mesh product, we don't really need to worry about that since the stone veneer can dry in both directions. However, we do have an additional step of attaching a lath, and that can actually add some complexity when it comes to installing this stuff over exterior rigid insulation. The trick here is to provide some temporary attachment for that entangled mesh through the rigid insulation, and then install the metal lath over that entangled mesh, fastening it through the mesh and through the rigid insulation into the studs with epoxy-coated steel wood screws at the manufacturer's recommended fastener spacing and embedment. In most cases, this is going to be around six inches on center vertically into each stud. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers. Every week we get flooded with requests for consultations for projects both large and small in scale around the US and Canada, and sometimes even in Europe, and I'm pleased to announce that we're now offering general consulting services outside of our typical scope of plan and spec reviews and detail drawing development. Sometimes we're brought in just to answer questions and give guidance on how to best address certain aspects of a project, whether it's helping clients determine whether a vented or conditioned roof assembly makes sense based on their performance and durability goals, what type of insulation products to use, how to air seal very specific specific locations, how to retrofit capillary breaks and drainage, and so we're here as your resource in pre-construction to set you up for success. So how exactly does our general consulting service work and what do you get? Due to the volume of requests that we receive each week, we obviously can't work with everyone, and so we've implemented a 10-hour minimum project scope, which is paid as a retainer, and that's just our minimum level of scope and engagement to make sure that we're giving your project sufficient attention throughout the entire process, and also helps to keep things more manageable on our end. As you progress through your project, you will inevitably have some questions that will come up, and we're here to answer those questions as they come. You can schedule meetings with us, send us emails, request us to look into unique building conditions, and provide general feedback. We occasionally issue sketches and written documentation as needed to help clarify any points that we discussed, and provide additional educational resources for you and your team so that you can successfully move forward with your project with confidence. If you're looking for the additional help and need guidance on your project, but you're not quite at the point where you need detail drawings or have architectural plans for us to review, this is the best service for you. So fill out the contact form below, give us some information about your project, and we'll be in touch soon. Cheers.